I want to thank all of you for, for, for agreeing to do this for us. This is our first time uh, uh, setting this up uh, like this. We are going to be doing this every single year uh, in uh, probably not like this exact setup, but we'll be doing this every year. There's an executive order that I sign, uh, going to sign that, uh, you know, suggests that Juneteenth is a, a celebratory uh, day for us, but uh, is we're not taking it as a day uh, off to go shopping, to hang out. Uh, we're taking this as a day to study, to, to, to understand why we need to celebrate Juneteenth in the first place, to give our employees some information, some education, uh, at the same time. So that's what we want to do. Uh, and, and we have a, a incredible panel. So I, I will let you guys, uh, uh, talk for yourself. So first we have professor Melissa Cooper, uh, from Rutgers. And, uh, you know, we are so happy, uh, to have our neighbor here with us, uh, you know, talking to, to the, uh, employees here at the city of Newark and, and, and many of them are also residents. So, uh, we thank you, uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Good morning to everyone. Um, it's a great honor to participate in this very important conversation and commemoration on a panel comprised of such an amazing group of visionaries, you know, visionaries with whom I share some history. I was surprised and happy to learn um, that I would be in conversation with Professor Sanchez and Mayor Baraka and Junius Williams. Sonia Sanchez was my professor um, when I was an undergrad at Temple oh. University. Her class was one of the most memorable courses that I took at Temple. And um, I believe I still have the blues poem that I wrote that semester. Uh, my students and I were fortunate to have Mayor Baraka as a guest speaker so many years ago when I taught sociology at Columbia High School. So it's good to see you again, um, Raz. And I certainly consider it an honor to be in conversation with Junius Williams, a history maker in so many ways. Um, I'm grateful for this opportunity to be here with all of you sharing digital and virtual space now at during this moment um, when a meditation on our shared past is essential. This moment when we begin to imagine a more free and a more just future. Um, what I'd like to offer you this morning is a historical meditation, right? A meditation in which we contemplate how newly freed men and newly freed women and children marked and claimed and took and defined freedom. A meditation through which we consider both the legacies of and the continuities in the Black freedom struggle. I've decided to center on the freedom struggle because Juneteenth is most popularly associated with the final arrival of freedom. You know, as a history professor, one of the things that I think is most important for my students to learn is that history is complicated and that the history of African Americans' freedom fight stretches back further than we think, uh, much further back than more familiar episodes in the Black past, like the Civil Rights Movement. Um, and that fight marches far into the future and certainly into the present day. And the lines that we commonly use to mark events and moments and achievements are in some ways hazy. For example, the Black freedom fight began long before the Civil War. You know, resistance is an essential element in the history of African Americans. And it took many forms, right? So in some instances, it began in the belly of the slave ship. In other instances, we find Blacks who lived in North American colonies waging their own campaign for independence during the revolutionary period. You know, and few Americans know about the 1739 slave uprising uh, that took place in South Carolina near the shores of the Stono River. And fewer Americans know about Mumbet, the, the woman enslaved in Massachusetts who was inspired by public discussions about the Declaration of Independence and filed um, a lawsuit that secured her freedom. And in both cases, Blacks pursued freedom even before America was a nation. 
and before the nation declared its commitment to the concept of freedom itself. And for Black people, the pursuit of freedom would continue, continue well into the early days in the life of the New Republic um, and continue throughout the antebellum era. And what this tells us about the concept of emancipation and liberation is that the pen stroke may have legally codified freedom, but the making of the meaning of freedom had begun generations before the Emancipation Proclamation. So when we think about emancipation, it might serve us better as students of history to think about emancipation in moments. You know, for example, one of the things that becomes really clear during the Civil War is that the very geography of freedom shifted. Instead of mapping freedom as a status that could only be secured within the lines of, you know, that marked the boundaries of northern states, Blacks um, seeking to emancipate and liberate themselves looked for freedom behind the lines of Union soldier camps. And when we look closely at the documents that chronicle the Black experience at the moment of emancipation, um, you know, January 1st, 1863, when the proclamation is issued, we find different snapshots of a variety of pictures of what marking their new status as freedom looked like for Black people. For example, Susie King Taylor, uh, the Black woman who served as the army nurse for the Union um, during the Civil War in coastal Georgia, a woman who learned to read and write in a secret school attended by enslaved children in Savannah. She documented her memory of emancipation in a memoir that she published in 1902. And in the memoir, she described a scene that took place on Georgia's coast in January of 1863, a scene that portrays a, a special celebration that was arranged to listen to the reading of President Lincoln's proclamation. She remembered the reading of the document and the feast that followed and the soldiers who had a good time and the merriment and the cheers and the singing and the shouts that echoed throughout the camp. But for others in the region, the Declaration of Emancipation was a much more elusive proposition, a promise that was made, but was yet to be actualized. And during the 1930s, when writers and researchers for the Federal Writers Project interviewed an ex-slave named William Ballard in the Winsboro area of South Carolina, William told interviewers that he stayed on the plantation where he had been a slave for months working for meager wages before leaving in pursuit of emancipation's promise. Similar stories, you know, tales of delayed freedom are rooted in the origins of Juneteenth, the holiday that we're gathered to uh, commemorate today. You know, Juneteenth, the name combination of June and 19th, became a popular name for uh, Emancipation Day among Black Texans and eventually Black Americans living in other regions. Um, the holiday, you know, celebrates the day in 1865 when Major General Gordon Granger announced um, emancipation in Galveston at the end of the Civil War. The announcement was a revelation for those captive in Confederate strongholds who had not yet received word uh, of their liberation. And while early commemorations of Juneteenth um, as a holiday focused on the celebration of freedom and the end of slavery, the holiday has become a Black American Independence Day. And over the years, the number of states and communities who have chosen to adopt the date to mark the final arrival of freedom and the end of slavery, the list has grown. Um, and parades and concerts and all sorts of festivities have become common ways to observe Juneteenth. There's no question that today, June 19th, 2020, we're living in a historic moment. Um, but I must admit that I find it ironic or maybe not so ironic that the renewed calls for the recognition 
of the inherent value of Black lives and the desire for Black freedom that persists has resulted in this delayed acknowledgement of Black people's delayed emancipation. That Juneteenth is sort of emerging as an interracial national symbol of a wider recognition of all of the horizons of Black freedom yet to be crossed is telling. Um, and in that way, Juneteenth, the Juneteenth commemoration becomes more than a celebration. It's actually like a challenge that pushes back against the meta narrative of the great emancipator's pen stroke. And it reminds us of how African Americans have continually struggled to give shape and meaning to the values that the nation claims to hold dear. So those are some thoughts that I hope will help you to contextualize and inspire more thoughts about the meaning and value of this day. Thank you. Thank you. I can't hear you. Thank you, I'm sorry uh, for being on with us, Professor Cooper. We appreciate you, good to see you again. And uh, hopefully when we do this some more, we can have you involved in it as much as we can. So yes, uh, yes. I'm, yeah, I'm sure our uh, folks got some Good information out there. Hopefully they took some notes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. All right. So it is now uh, my pleasure to have Honorable Sonia Sanchez, who is a long uh, time uh, activist, uh, artist, writer, uh, historian in, in, in my eyes. Uh, just her her movement through history itself is, is, is uh, enough uh, uh, for us to, um, you know, revere. I am so excited and happy that she, at the very, very last minute, all of them did, by the way, at the very last minute, at the very last minute, uh, agreed to uh, be on this call with you guys. It is an extremely, extremely important opportunity and historical moment for us here in the city of Newark. We have never, ever, 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 probably in the history of this city, put together a citywide teaching and seminar about the history and struggle of, of anybody, uh, for that matter, but you know, for uh, African Americans, but more importantly, uh, the struggle for democracy in this country that involves all nationalities, really. And uh, you know, we appreciate that, and I, I, I uh, appreciate uh, Sister Sanchez for agreeing to do this for us. She is a friend of my family and a friend of the people. So, that being said, the floor is yours. Uh, you can do and say whatever it is you like. Uh, Thank you, my dear brother. Yeah. Oh, it's so you. Woke up this morning with my eyes on Amadou Diallo, Sabrina Fulton, Sean Bell, Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, Michael Brown, Eric Gardner, Rolando Castillo, Rihanna Taylor, Sandra Bond, George Floyd, George Floyd, George Floyd. I say, hey, hey, woke up this morning with my eyes on Rakia Boyd, Jordan David, Bernicia McBride, Richard Holtz, Taisha Miller, Walter Scott, Ernest Sutter White, Dondra Hamilton, John Crawford, LeVar Jones, Romaine Briston, Charlie Cunong, N. Vinzant, Tony Robinson, Anthony Hill, Jane Stamps, William Hardgrove, George Hall, A.C. Jackson, George Floyd, George Floyd, George Floyd, woke up this morning with my eyes on Black Lives Matter all over the world, sisters and brothers coming together, Raz Baraka leading his city, marching, marching, marching in unity with the people, all of the young brothers and sisters walking, demonstrating, advocating change in the United States and the world. We are here because today is Juneteenth. June my chief, also known as Jubilee Day, Liberation Day, and Freedom Day. It's an unofficial American holiday and an official Texas state holiday celebrated annually on June 19th. It commemorates the Union General Gordon Granger 
applies in federal orders in the city of Galveston, Texas on June 19, 1865, proclaiming all enslaved Africans in Texas were now free, 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 a little bit late, but free, 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 significantly because the Emancipation Proclamation had formally freed enslaved Africans about two and a half years earlier, and the Civil War had largely ended with the defeat of the Confederate States in April. The enforcement had been slow and slow and slow and quite inconsistent. We are here because the National Negro Congress petition against police brutality in 1938 said, our lives, our homes, our liberties each day are made less secure because of unrestrained and unpunished police brutality. We're here because after emancipation, lynching, the major form of violence used against African Americans from 1882 to 1910 resulted from the encouragement of law enforcement agents on their abdicating their equal protection responsibilities between 1882 and 1930. Approximately 3,000 Blacks, most males, were lynched. Police brutality or misconduct has been the trigger incident that sparked every Martin rebellion from the 1935 Harlem riots to the 1992 LA event. In contemporary America, police brutality is the preferred form of social control. We are here because 20 Africans were left at Jamestown in 1619 by the captain of a Dutch ship those Africans were listed as servants. We are here because the first enslaved Africans arrived in the Dutch colony of New Amsterdam, now New York City, on 1626. We are here because the boys wrote, this is a beautiful world. This is a wonderful America, which the founding fathers dreamed until their sons and daughters devoured it in the blood of slavery and devoured it in greed. We are here for more reasons than history and herstory. We are here to quote Tolstoy. They are men who say, I sit on a man's back, choking him and making him carry me. And yet I assure myself and others that I am sorry for him and wish to lighten his load by all possible means, except by getting off his neck and off his back. We are here because of the first middle passage where more than 60 million Africans lost their lives to slavery and the slave trade. We are here because the founding fathers of the Constitution declared black men three-fifths of a man and ignored black women entirely. We are here because from that day forward, the Constitution has ensured that property rights would be more sacred than human rights. We are here from the Emancipation Proclamation to the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments we are here because legal documents and laws have influenced Black life almost as much as the Bible. The Emancipation Proclamation freed enslaved men and women in areas of the South still in rebellion against the U.S. while preserving Southern capitalism. The 14th Amendment abolished slavery while leaving the sociocultural white supremacy intact. The 14th Amendment guaranteed equal protection for all citizens and granted citizenship to African Americans. The 15th Amendment, ah, the 15th Amendment guaranteed black men the right to vote while the culture of fear and intimidation made the reality an illusion. We are here to understand finally the influence and importance of our sisters and brothers in the 50s, the 60s and 70s we must understand the 60s and 70s and the people who raised struggle for us. That understanding must be informed not just with reason, but with feeling, with a sense of mission, and with a guttural level of understanding that people have struggled and died, that people are dying at home and abroad, waiting for justice, that people are trying to live as true patriots in their country when they are called refugees, when hurricanes and emergencies occur. We are here to say what Martin Luther King said, we are called upon to raise certain basic questions about the white society 
that must be based on political education, which begins with the structure of the American society and its interlocking participation and influence in the world outside America, but which is connected to and inseparable from America. We are here because Malcolm said the problem facing our people here in America is bigger than other personal or organizational differences. Therefore, as leaders, we must stop worrying about the threat that we seem to think we pose to each other's personal prestige and concentrate our united efforts towards solving the unending hurt exploitation that is being done daily to our people in America. It doesn't matter who is the largest so-called minority, so we must move now, fight this divisive mind in our communities, prisons, in our schools, in our streets. We're here because more than a century ago, Frederick Douglass, Martin Delaney, Harriet Tubman, David Walker, Sojourner Truth, Francis Harper fought for us. And what did they see for Africans, Blacks in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries? And are we the persons that they saw? Are we doing what they wanted? Did these freedom fighters involve themselves in debates about the contours of tomorrow? Yes, but they moved with a vision of better days ahead and focus their struggles in helping to realize a freedom that would be meaningful. Did they engage as we must engage in shaping social values that could provide the basis of making it in this century? For them, it was a question of whether they would allow the constitution of slavery to crush the rising tide of black history and humanity. But without addressing that question, speculation about life in the 18th and 19th centuries would have been flight of fancy. We are here because the question for us in the 21st century is not the abolition of slavery as it was for our leaders of the 18th and 19th centuries. The question of our day must be, can we reverse the tide of genocide against Africans and others in the diaspora? And we cannot approach the question of reversing the tide of genocide piecemeal. This is not just an issue of whether affirmative action will work, not just an issue of electoral politics. It is finally the only issue is do we have the courage to oppose all forces that directly or indirectly foster a climate of terror in which genocide can take place with impunity. Do we have the courage to walk in the light that is love, peace, resistance? Can you say resist? Women, men, children, do we have the courage to walk in the light of activism and resistance? Can you resist? Can you resist? Can you resist? Do we have the courage to lift our eyes off the ground? Do we have the courage to oppose the genocidal forces residing in our own breasts so that we don't exclude others different from us, the poor ones, the less educated ones, the different classes, so that we don't continue the assassinations of each other, so that never again do the damage to each other under the guise of personal righteousness or gossip? Do we have the courage to speak out and work for free health care for all, guarantee wages for all, reparations for Native Americans, Africans, and African Americans? Do we have the courage to protect, defend unions, defend gays and lesbians and transgenders and bisexuals and poor people and working class people and elders and Haitians and Africans and African Americans and prisoners? Do we have the courage to see the beauty in ourselves, in our natural hair and curly hair and straightened hair? Ah, straight hair and our thick thin lips, our brown, black, yellow, white skins. Do we have the courage to transform our hands into miracle songs for this country and the world? Do we have the courage to say, as Pablo Neruda said, I exist not if I do not attend to the pain of those who suffer. They are my pain, for I cannot be without existing for all, for all who are silent and oppressed. I come from the people and I sing for them. My poetry is song and punishment. I am told you belong to darkness, ha <laughs> ha, perhaps, perhaps, but I walk towards light. We are here because Brother Martin said, we got to camp in 
put our tents in front of the White House. Did you hear me? We got to make it known that until, until our problem is solved, America may have many, many days, but they will be full of trouble. There will be no rest. There will be no tranquility in the country until the nation comes to terms with our problem. Are you willing to do this just as they did in Wisconsin, in the streets of New York City, in Ferguson, in Brooklyn, in Oakland, in Philadelphia, in Chicago, in Newark, huh? Martin said there are 40 million poor people here. And one day we must ask the question, why are there 40 million poor people in America? When you begin to ask that question, you are raising questions about the economic system, about a broader economic distribution of wealth. When you ask that question, you begin to question the capitalistic economy. I am simply saying that more and more, we've got to begin to ask questions about the whole society, not just the police departments and killings of more men, women, and children. We are called upon to help the discouraged beggars in life's marketplace. But one day, we must come to see that an edifice which produces beggars need restructuring. It means that questions must be raised. You see, my friends, my brothers, whenever you deal with these, you begin to ask the question, who owns the oil? You begin to ask the question, who owns the iron ore? You begin to ask the question, why is that it? that people have to pay water bills in a world that is two thirds water. We're here uh, and I'm going to go and move to another section. We are here because I talk a lot about Brother Martin here. He, Brother Martin says, we must rapidly begin to shift from a thing oriented society to a person oriented society when machines and computers uh, profit motors and property rights are considered more important than people. The giant triplets of racism, materialism, and mil militarism are inescapable of being concerned. A true revolution, he said, of values will soon cause us to question the fairness and justice of many of our past and present policies. A true revolution of values will lay hands on the world order and say of wars. This way of settling differences is not just. The business of burning human beings with napalm, of filling our nation's homes with orphans and widows, of injecting poisonous drugs of hate into veins of people normally humane, of sending men and women home from dark and bloody battlefields, physically handicapped and psychologically deranged, cannot be reconciled with wisdom, justice, and love. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift or education or health is approaching spiritual death. Now, I want to just continue to say that we are here to remember King's battle against ignorance, fascism, racial and social and economic oppression, obscene images of the poor. Remember Brother Martin's final crusade to end poverty through guaranteed jobs with decent wages, he and the sanitary workers in Memphis marched together. These workers carried 55 gallon drums of trash on their heads for $170 an hour and had few rights as workers. People laughed at the men and called them the walking buzzers. The walking buzzers indeed. The walking buzzers, the stalkers of death things, the death pickers. We're here because of our children who one day would ask us like Rene Castillo asked, what did we do when our nations drive us slowly, like a sweet fire, small and alone? When they were asked, what did you do when the poor suffered, when tenderness and life burned out in them? We the lovers of cells, the lovers of people and justice and freedom and democracy. The Juneteenth celebrators would turn and say, we resisted. I know that one of the words given to us a long time ago was resist. When an enslaved person was branded with a large aura, after a second escape attempt, that aura was resist. Resist is an ancient word, a 
holy word, a church going word, a womanist word, a political word, a freedom workers word, a gay word, a lesbian word, a bisexual transgendered word, a black, brown, white, yellow word to teach to our children, all children, as they enter schools, a word to teach puppies and deny the self. It is a word to teach to ourselves as we hum ourselves into existence each morning, giving praise that we are alive for another day. So we must create new ways of learning, new ways of struggling, challenge old ways. We must give lessons, ideas that will sail home like a Maya Angelou poem, human and life-given. Give us the history of a Toni Morrison story that gave us the right of the black tongue, the right to write our own stories and love ourselves. Give us a sweet honey in the rock song that makes us cry, amen, amen, amen. A woman, a woman, a woman, a woman. Give us the brilliance of Mfunde Ella Baker, who have organized Nick students with love and information and trust and dedication. Give us the brilliance of student activists like Judy Richardson, Kwame Ture, Charlie Cobb, Mike, uh, Thugwell, Gloria Richardson, Marion Barry, Robert Moses, Bernice Reagan, John Lewis, who sailed into battle knowing that their words and activism would help change the world. Give us the brilliance and love and information and beauty um, and poetry of Amiri Baraka as he organized and taught us how to live, how to live in Newark, how to live in Newark and in the world. So I want to say to you, let us move. Let us work for change. Let us learn how to humanize ourselves and corporations and banks and prisons and schools and police departments and churches and mosques and synagogues and city governments and the Congress and the White House. Let us answer King's long ago question, is there a non-violent peacemaking army that can shut down the Pentagon. Let us remember that our first teacher is our own heart. Let us make every place we enter into a holy place, our churches, our schools. Let us come together as we organize and celebrate this prayer called humans, this prayer called you and me, me and you, this prayer called Martin Luther King, Martin, Baraka, Ella Baker, young people dancing, working in of America organizing, making Black Lives Matter. You and I know that we must position ourselves in the world with these new freedom spaces we are learning as we go out into the streets of America, where you will recreate yourselves working in concert with young, old, middle-aged people. A writer said, power corresponds to the human ability to act in concert Power is never the property of an individual. It belongs to a group and remains in existence only as long as the group keeps together. Woke up this morning. I say woke up this morning with my eyes on you. Woke up this morning with my eyes on you and Brother Baraka. Woke up this morning with you marching with the brothers and sisters because you resist, you resist, you resist, you resist, and you move. We resist, we teach us how we should move. And for brother George Floyd, I want to end by saying, I send the wind to caress your breath, my dear brother. I send the rain to rinse your blood, my dear brother. I send the sun to iron out your death fleets, my dear brother. I send the river to carry you across mountains, my dear brother. I send a sister's memory to carry you home, my dear brother. Hey, hey. Hey, 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 our brother has died. Hey, hey, I say, our father has died. I say, hey, 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 our son has died. I say, hey, 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 another black man has died. And this earth is demanding justice for you and many others, my dear brother. The earth says, no more black breaths dying under a policeman's knee. I say, no more black breaths dying under a policeman's knee. Hey, hey, hey. And we say, it's a new day. It's a new day. It's a new day. And we shall resist, resist every day and live. And we say to you, my dear brother George, a people's memory to carry you home. A people's memory to carry you home. And we say to Brother Baraka, my brother, we love you. Thank you. The work. Move, 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 move us. Make us, make us become human again on this planet. Thank you. Um.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was excellent. It's excellent. We appreciate you for being no. on here. That was incredible. Historical moment for us here in the city of Newark. We appreciate you. Uh, uh, hopefully you have an incredible day and week, weekend, but that was uh, awesome for us. I know the, uh, you know, we, we, there are many people in this city who never get an opportunity to hear you or listen to you in person. So this virtual uh, thing is, is, is the next best opportunity that they have. So we appreciate you being on here with us and hopefully we can uh, call on you in the future when we need to. And uh, if you haven't uh, had the opportunity to uh, purchase any of uh, Sonia Sanchez's material, her books, uh, they are available. Please go and, and do that immediately. Uh, I know that they have them in, in, in all, go across the street to the black bookstore across the street. They probably have a few of her books over there as well. The young ladies who own that bookstore over there, but you can get all her books probably online as well. So please, uh, we, we want to support her. Uh, we thank her for coming on and giving us this invaluable information and time. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, we, we love to you and your family. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna uh, close this out with Junius Williams, who is the city's historian uh, in Newark. Uh, he uh, uh, obviously has got a lot of information, a wealth of knowledge, particularly uh, you know because of the movement, but also because of the the, the work that he's done locally here in the city of Newark. Uh, uh, throughout the years, plus with our young people uh, as well. He's been doing incredible things. So he is our city historian and we want to give him an opportunity to uh, share as well. Junius, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Sonia. That was always moving, always moving. One of the major aspects of successful slavery is control of information, control of information, control of who we are, who we were as African people, control of our lives, control of our own interpretation of self, control of religion, control of language. So it shouldn't be surprised that the slaves in Texas didn't know that they were free because they didn't get the memo so to speak. So it was not until a general came into Galveston, Texas to tell the enslaved African Americans that yes, you can leave whenever you want to. Lincoln had issued the proclamation, the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, but here it was 1865 and these people had not been informed. Now a lot of you may think, well, why isn't that so? Surely somebody would have told them. But you see, slavery was a closed society. People were not allowed to read. People were not allowed to go up and down to see somebody else in another city. You couldn't move around, you couldn't do anything. And if anything we can do, anything we can celebrate with this, celebration we have here today about Juneteenth is just the understanding of just how closed off people were and the consequences thereof. But you see, when the enslaved, the formerly enslaved African-Americans did find out, there was 51 miles between Galveston and Houston. And so they just passed the word from family to family family to family. I just found that out this morning from listening to Gerald Horn. But that's how we found out. We, we were innovative and of course festive as well. But I, I want to talk a little bit more about what it means not to know. What is the, the impact of not having information? We can, we can learn about that too. What can we learn about the, the misinformation, the disinformation? that occurs when people are enslaved? Well, because you see the, 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 the white people who were in charge, the, the slavers knew 
what was going on. The African Americans knew there was a, a, a great war going on, but there weren't that many battles in Texas, so people just didn't have that kind of information, but the slavers knew. And why was that so important? And it's one word, cotton, cotton. Just before the Civil War, cotton was the most important export, not just for the South, but for the entire United States of America. Cotton and other products related. But King Cotton, as they call it, they, in, in, in uh, 1790 in the South, there were about 600,000 slaves, but by 1810, there were 1.2 million slaves. Well, why was that so important? What, what was the transition? Well, it was something called a cotton gin. The cotton gin allowed the separation of cotton from the seed, so it was easier to pack, easier to send abroad. The United States of America became rich because of that export. 75% of the cotton in the world was produced in the United States produced by black people. So in the Mississippi Valley region of the United States, there were more millionaires than anywhere else. This was before the war. So during the war and just after the war, these people in, in Texas, and a lot of that cotton was produced in Texas. I don't remember the exact number of increases of folks who were coming in to Texas and bringing their slaves with them. But one thing they wanted to do is to keep Texas as a part of the slaveocracy. So when the war was over and the South had lost, they wanted to keep those slaves on the plantation. So there may have been a celebration on June 19th, but I assure you on June 20th, there was still hell to pay if you were still around. Some people got out of town, some people went somewhere else, but after that, Folks said, well, what are we going to do? Well, most of them stayed right there where they were. And, <clears throat> and that became the, the origin of this word called sharecropping, where you, you, you lease, quote unquote, a little land from the slave owner and from, from, from the former master who is now your new master, and you got a loan to put the seeds in, to put some flour on your table to bake some bread, whatever your kids needed, some, some of those, some of that clothing that you got that you made for yourself, but you made it out of the man material. You had to pay that back. And you never quite had enough. So that's what sharecropping was all about. It still tied people to the land. Now, the other thing that happened during that period of time was the, the rise of the police, because if people did want to leave, they did want to go somewhere else, to go to Detroit, to go to Newark, go to Los Angeles, wherever they heard about in their furthest and wildest dreams, because you see, most of them never thought they were going to be anything but slaves, but now they had a chance to dream a different dream. And so if they tried to go somewhere, that's when the police came in. The police were an invention of this period called post-slavery. That's when the police were given license to do whatever they could. That's when certain laws were developed called loitering. Where are you going, boy? Well, I'm following this railroad track because I'm going north. No, you're not. You're loitering. We're gonna put you in jail. And then they would lease back the services, the labor of the same people that they, Go arrested for loitering to, to places like Bessemer Steel down there in Alabama. So you would work at the lowest level and you may have gotten a few cents an hour for working down there, but some kind of way you never quite worked off your sentence or it was extended or you got so sick until you just died. So all of that was part of the the misinformation about this thing called emancipation, there was, there, there, we, we don't find enough about that. We don't hear that uh, much about what was going on during that period. So just to fast forward a little bit, 
when we when we come to a place like Newark where people finally got out, if if they were trying to get out a little bit later to go up, maybe maybe after World War One, when uh, there was a great migration, or World War Two, those were the two great migrations in which a, a lot of black people came to places like Newark and Chicago and and Philadelphia and uh, all the way out to Los Angeles and and wherever people could go. There was still misinformation and disinformation. For one thing, those police tried to stop the people from coming up here. They'd get you at the train station. They'd get you at the bus station, whatever was available, whatever transportation was there, and actually kidnap you and take you back to those plantations. So once we got to Newark, and a great number of people did come to Newark. A lot of people came to Newark because they thought they were in New York. Newark sounds like New York when the conductor's talking about on the train where you sat in the back of the train. But you got off here and you came because you wanted some work and there was work at the bottom of the ladder. So people came and, and joined the free Africans and the, the other Africans who, African-Americans who were here before most of the European uh, folks were here as well. And African Americans found themselves at, once again at the bottom of the barrel. They were getting paid, but they weren't getting paid much. And you still had to endure the problems of racism, inequality, people calling you nigger, and the police acting out just to what they felt was necessary. So w when we look at a city like Newark, we, we see the impact of the uh, slaveocracy, the impact of the emancipation, uh, the impact of the uh, work that still had to be done to get people free. And all along, we were fighting. We were fighting. Don't get the impression that we were not fighting. We were, we, we were not, because once, once folks got to a point where they could get information, the, the correct information about their own condition, people did, in fact, fight back all along, right from the point people got on those slave ships in Africa all the way over here. There were people who enlightened themselves and fought, and we won some important battles. The other professor was talking about the Stono Rebellion in uh, New Orleans, for example. That was one of the, my, my, my favorite uh, uh, moments of, of, of history, of uh, historical enlightenment. When I just found out about that last year, our Africans marched on New Orleans, and they almost won, but they were just outgunned the Stono Rebellion. We hear about a few of them, but we didn't hear about that one. There was a, 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 a 500 Africans marched in from the country to take over the town of New Orleans. But So we were doing things that were the equivalent, mostly on the nonviolent side, and we have come up to the important part right now. Now, the, the last thing I want to say, uh, once we look at the whole question of uh, Juneteenth, what it should remind us of, when you look at what was happening, you find out what was not allowed to happen. It should make us think about reparations. It should make us think about reparations. We don't talk about that enough. If you do anything, if you reminded anything on Juneteenth, think about all the hours and years and all the hardships and the money we did not earn, the money that was earned for other people there's a, there's a concept in the law called unjust enrichment. I just gave a lecture to a law firm to talk about them majoring or maybe bringing a case on the basis of unjust enrichment. If you do something for somebody and they make money off your labor, you are entitled to be paid for that. So what is the measure? Well, the measure is all that wealth that I was talking to you about before. Slavery, and specifically the development of cotton at the middle of the 18th, I'm sorry, the 19th century in the 1800s, that was worth one half of what America was developing financially and putting out into the world to develop other kinds of institutions and to embark upon other ventures. We paid for that. We should be reimbursed. If you want a little bit more on that, there's an article in Atlantic Magazine by Ta-Nehisi Coates 
called the case for reparations. We should visit that. We should visit other kinds of activities like that. And on June 10th, if we don't think about anything else, we should think about a new concept for many of us called reparations. Now, as our young people are going about the business of demonstrating, I think they should begin talking about that as well. I think reparations should be put on the plate. We can talk about the police all you want, but until we get equal and have the kind of wherewithal that we need to have to really be equal in this country, then I think that's what this whole concept of Juneteenth should be about. So back to you, Mayor. Well, I wanna, I wanna thank uh, obviously you, uh, uh, Junius, and Sonia, who's signed off, uh, Dr. Cooper, Professor Cooper at Rutgers, everybody for uh, the last minute uh, conversation with my employees. I appreciate it. I'm sure many of them appreciate this information as well. You couldn't pay for this information. You have to go to a class or a school and, 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 and sign up to get this kind of information. And God knows to have Sonia do a, a piece as long as she did, as informative she did, it is, is very historical and people pay lots of money to, to hear that. So I appreciate uh, you guys being on here. And these discussions that we're gonna have annually, uh, we'll, we'll start off talking about Juneteenth, obviously, but we wanna talk about uh, the struggle for democracy period in this country to fight to make America more a more perfect union, more democratic, more accessible uh, uh, to all Americans uh, despite their nationality, their, their language, uh, their religion, uh, all of these things, we, we, we want to talk about that. But at, at the base of that has always been uh, the African-American struggle uh, in this country that people have united around. Uh, and I think we are in a very, very uh, pivotal part of history now. Uh, if, if you agree, um, you know, uh, right now, everybody is talking about Juneteenth celebrations. And I want to close on, I spoke to my mother this morning and told her what we were doing and all this hoopla around, you know, Juneteenth. And she reminded me, and I said it on my, uh, my uh, video that I put out, that uh, we've been celebrating Juneteenth, uh, you know, forever. Uh, you know, a brother named Luke Bond and my brother Obelaj used to get up early in the morning, 5 a.m. and play drums all the way down Clinton Avenue, I mean, all the way down 10th Street uh, from uh, between Avon and Madison all the way down to Clinton Avenue and wake the entire neighborhood up. Obviously, when I was a kid, I used to be aggravated by that, uh, uh, them playing the drums early in the morning. When you got older, you began to understand what they were doing and, and, and letting people know that we were celebrating, you know, our, uh, our 4th of July, uh, which is Juneteenth, and January 1st, which is the, emanci the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, but um, so I thank you, and I, I'm sure everybody got a wealth of information out of this. Um, and I appreciate all of the employees for signing on and listening and getting this information. Hopefully you took some notes uh, and you can have other conversations about it uh, as well. Uh, and, um, you know, next time we'll, we, we're going to put the word out a little better. We'll have more time uh, to, in fact, do that while the rest of the country is trying to find ways to have a day off. We're trying to find a way to make sure that we, we enlighten each other and understand the importance of celebrating one another. Uh, and our uh, movement through history and our connectedness to this planet and understand that n until everybody is free, uh, nobody will be. And that, that all lives won't matter until black lives matter. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Junius. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for tuning in uh, today. What, what do you ha whatever your directors tell you to do at this point, uh, you know, is, is completely and totally up to them. So Happy Juneteenth, everybody. Thanks for signing in.